The McFarland Center sponsors and supports lectures, discussions, and conferences on questions of uh, meaning, morality, and mutual obligation. You'll see our talks online, and ideally soon this talk will be online uh, if you've missed it, if your friends missed it for class or something. Uh, you get the best. You get it here live, so you get to engage with the speaker. But the others who uh, missed something good, you can tell them to watch that online at holycross.edu slash McFarland Center. Uh, we're pleased to be co-sponsoring today's talk with the Education Department, and I want to thank uh, Professor Jack Schneider uh, for taking the lead in conceiving the event. Uh, we're also going to co-sponsor an event on March 2nd uh, with Ethan Hutt from uh, an educational historian and assistant professor at the University of Maryland who will lecture on equity, schools, and testing, what national achievement scores do and don't tell us. Uh, so I'd encourage you to join us for that. Presumably you have some interest in educational issues. Today, though, I'm really uh, happy to welcome uh, Douglas Gagnon, uh, who will talk on equity, schools, and the American dream, what the data tell us about the future of equity-oriented policy. Doug is a research associate at the University of New Hampshire's Carsey School of Public Policy. He recently spent a year with the Delaware Department of Education as a data fellow through Harvard's Strategic Data Project Initiative. Project. He's also worked on research projects with the Center for Assessment in Dover, New Hampshire. Doug's research has focused on teacher quality and effectiveness, equal opportunity in K-12 public schools, federal and state-oriented policy, context of urbanicity, and student discipline. He's also published his research in a number of peer-reviewed journal articles and policy briefs. Doug has experience on the other side of the research as well as a former high school physics teacher both in New York City and in New Zealand, which sounds pretty good. Uh, he holds a PhD in education policy and leadership from the University of New Hampshire. So please join me in welcoming Doug Gag Gagnon. Thanks, Tom. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks for giving me the full three seat buffer and sitting beyond that. Um, I, I, that was pretty much a full introduction to me. I'm at the Carsey School of Public Policy, which is a, a, we have a pretty wide purchase in terms of what we look at. Um, and my role there is to kind of bring in an education focus and look at issues of access and education. Um, and so today we're looking at equity, the American dream, and, and how schools fit into that, that picture. Um, and it's, I think it's a pretty well-timed uh, talk given what's, what's happening right now in our, our political system as well. So <clears throat> first let's just get grounded in some terms uh, and why it's important, why we should be looking at these things. So what, what is equity? What is the American dream? Um, well, equity is a, is, a, is a fundamental American value. Um, Todd Dimitri would say it's one of the, the five big values in education. Um, and essentially what it is, is is this issue of fairness to each going what they need. That's equity. Um, some people might refer to it as the equality of opportunity. Um, not the same thing as equality. Equality is more evenness, whereas equity is fair-mindedness. Um, so. A quick example would be if, if uh, parents have two children, and one's myopic and needs uh, reading glasses, and the other has 20-20 vision, uh, they would supply glasses to that one that, that needs glasses and, and zero glasses to the one that has perfect eyesight, right? So it's not an equal distribution, but it's equitable. It, people would agree that it's fair. So the American dream, which is this idea that you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps, that you can be socially mobile if you're smart, if you work hard, it's, it's really kind of goes hand in hand with notions of equity and fairness, right? That if you're, if you're given a good lot in life, uh, if, you, if you're given um, you know, strong skills and a motivation to do something with it, you can make something of yourself. Um, and there's been broad support for the American dream since we first started measuring whether or not people like the idea of the American dream about 50 years ago. And Robert Putnam in his book, Our Kids, uh, has this poll that that shows that 19 out of 20 Americans would agree with that statement that everyone in America should have equal opportunity to get ahead. Right? So these are really strong concepts that aren't, that aren't partisan whatsoever, the idea of American dream. Um, and this might be a little more surprising that 9 out of 10 Americans would, would agree that um, public education is a really important aspect of preserving equality of opportunity. And we'll come back to that. So first, let's, let's look at some of the data behind uh, the American dream and how it's doing. Uh, and, and the subject line lets you know that there's some, there's some signs of trouble of how the American dream actually looks in the US. 
Uh, and the first thing that uh, is often pointed out is that income inequality is rising in the US. And um, this might be a pretty familiar graph to a lot of you. Um, over the past uh, generation or two, we've seen big gains go to the top earners in the country, um, where everybody else has stayed flat. The Peloton has not moved. Um, and a, a couple kind of data points to pull out on this, um, right here, top 20%, uh, the top quintile will be coming back to what what the top quintile does, and then the bottom quintile as well. Look at what those values are. It's about $150,000 a year on average. That's what the top quintile of earners are making in the US. Um, and that's, of course, dragged up by the top percent or so that are making uh, much more money. So the, the floor threshold of a top 20% earner is only about $100,000 a year. So to be in the top quintile, you could be a family where you have a teacher and an accountant or a nurse practitioner, an electrician. Uh, these, these would be people that fall into the top quintile. People that by and large consider themselves middle class are actually top quintile earners in the US right now. So um, these aren't top quintile, don't consider them rich, consider them comfortable, except uh, obviously it also accounts for Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and everyone else that is rich. And then the bottom 20%, less than 20K a year on average, uh, really, that's about almost one in five people is in poverty in the U.S. You can kind of think of the bottom quintile earners as b being either on or below the poverty line. So that's where those, those kind of quintiles match up, and, and they've been spreading apart. Um, another sign of, of trouble is that the achievement gap has been rising over the past year and a half, and specifically between high and low income students, it's been rising. It's about 30 to 40 percent larger than it was a generation ago. That comes from Sean Reardon's work. Uh, and in fact, over that generation, uh, the black-white achievement gap and the high-low poverty gap, as operationalized by Reardon, has switched. So now uh, being, being low poverty is, is twice as strong a predictor as race. Uh, and, and a generation ago, it was just the opposite, where race was about twice as strong a predictor than, than poverty was. So there are these real under, undercurrents going on in terms of widening gaps in, in America. And this isn't to say that... Uh, that you can't be socially mobile, that's not what this data right here is saying. This is saying that um, basically there's farther to go from top to bottom than there was before. Or some people might say the rungs and the ladder are getting further apart. So what about people's chances of actually moving up the ladder? Um, and some of the most compelling work on this has been done by Raj Chetty and friends. Uh, and he was looking at probably the, the, the American dream metric, which is uh, intergenerational social mobility. So the percentage chance that you go uh, rags to riches. And, and the, the metric that he uses oftentimes is bottom quintile to top quintile, which is what I was just talking about. So right here, this graph is looking at uh, all five quintiles and, and their chance of ending up being top earners, depending on whether or not they, they were born to, um, according to the, the income of their parents. Um, and here we have, the, this is the top quintile right here. So uh, they have about a one in three chance of ending up in the, in the top quintile like their parents were. And if you start out in the bottom quintile, you have a much smaller chance, about a 9% chance. And that's the rags to riches story. Um, important thing to note about this is that this is inherently lagged a generation, right? So a, a child born today, we won't know how well they fare mobily uh, for another 25 years. So. Uh, there are a lot of re you wouldn't be a fool for assuming that this could get worse in time, given that the rungs and the ladder are getting further apart, which was that, that last slide. Um, but there's a ton of variability across the U.S. Uh, and, and when we look at trends across region, they become quite stark. So down here in the south, um, this, is the, this is basically the, the percent chance of going rags to riches. Uh, we just saw on the last slide, it's about 9% of people in the bottom quintile wind up being top quintile. But if you're born in this area of the US, you have about half that chance of, of making that social mobile jump. Um, but if you're born in DC or, or Boston or San Jose or Salt Lake City, you have two to three times the odds. Uh, and then you know the breadbasket does pretty well as well for most part. Um, 
And this is also by work by Raj Shetty. Uh, probably the, an, an even more interesting part of this is not just that it's geographically variable, but that uh, characteristics of the, of the county or the metro area are really strong correlates to social mobility. So he found things such as school quality, uh, residential desegregation, family structure, a more intact family structure. Uh, these things are all s associated with higher social mobility. So, so in short, it, so his conclusion would be the American dream, you know, this, this spread in between um, high and low earners and chances of making it um, isn't so good and, and the American dream might be better deemed the Danish dream or the Canadian dream because they're much more compressed. Um, but there are certainly spots in the U.S. where it looks pretty good. Uh, but the, the corollary to that is there are spots where it looks pretty much awful, right? Um, now, how, does, how might the, your chances of being socially mobile uh, vary by your education level? Um, this is probably pretty predictable as well. So right here, these two stack bar graphs, they're looking at um, both of these are born into po the poverty quartile, that lowest quartile. Um, and, and what are their chances of, of landing in each of the next, uh, each of the five poverty quartiles as an adult? And the difference being this group right here are those that were born poor and don't get a high school degree. And these here were born poor, go on to get a college degree. Um, and you see if you're born poor and, and you don't get a, a high school degree, uh, your best odds are to, to remain poor uh, and then followed by barely not poor. Um, with a real minuscule chance, 1% or so, of going rags to riches. Um, now, if you're a college grad, you, you actually have a better chance of becoming a top earner than, than falling back into poverty like your parents were when you were born. So these are real stark trends here of social mobility by education. Now, this isn't to say that it's causal, right? There are a lot of underlying factors that are different between these two groups. Um, a lot of those things I mentioned before, probably family structure, perhaps parenting, innate ability is probably different between these two groups. The neighborhoods they grew up in are probably different. But yet and all, there's a really strong connection between education and mobility, even when we hold parent income constant. Um, so that's basically all the data on, on where we are with social mobility, or all that I'll be presenting at least. Um, and one quick kind of aside that I think is important to mention anytime we talk about social mobility, and that is that a more conservative um, criticism of being worried about social mobility is that um, what about absolute poverty, right? If you look at the poor of today and compare them with the poor of a generation or two ago, you'll see that they look, they look a little bit better off or at least on par with where the poor were a generation or two ago. Um, but there are reasons to care about just relative differences in income and social mobility outside of the fact that our poor today might have better access to health care or are better clothed, et cetera, and have more creature comforts. Um, and the first really has to do with this idea of, of, the, uh, of a well-oiled democracy and what it requires and what inequality means to that democracy. And, and Put frank, inequality threatens democracy because political power is highly related to your exercise of your voice. Um, and, and sorry, it's highly related to your income. Um, and, and that political power, however you want to operationalize it, is related to income. So the more wealth you have, the more likely you are to vote, to actually hold office, to influence discourse through your money or through your own voice. Um, so in some ways, being poor and having a greater spread between the rich and the poor disenfranchises voice. Um, Gillens in 2012 suggests that even on the right and the left of the affluent, they share certain political beliefs that aren't shared with the poor. Um, therefore, there's certain views that, aren't, that don't trickle up and get represented by the affluent. Um, th there's really strong correlational evidence at the country level um, that links inequality to bad outcomes. So the more, the, the more unequal a country is, the lower reported happiness is, the lower the health uh, readings are, whether or not you control for absolute wealth. Um, and so that's, you know, it's, it's tough to get under the causal mechanisms of that, but it's still, um, it's worth pondering that that connections are there across the world. Um, and perhaps, perhaps unsurprisingly, social and cultural norms uh, reflect 
those of, of the affluent in society, right? So this is all to say that we should care about social mobility. We should care about relative gaps in income and your ability to go rags and riches outside of whether or not poor people um, are able to have their needs met. So just to recap so far, there was a lot of data being thrown your way. Um, take, the, take these three bullets from it. One, that there's broad support for the American dream. This isn't a left or the right ideal. This is something that's shared by almost everyone, except three of you in here don't, and that's it's too bad. Um, social mobility trends are troubling, to say the least. Right? When we actually break it down and look at how we're doing and compare it to other westernized countries, it doesn't look that good. Uh, and then bringing you back to that first slide, there's broad support for public education as a way to ensure the American dream and ensure equity. So what, how do schools interact with equitable principles? Um, you know, how do schools contribute to or slow the process of these growing inequities in America? And so let's try to dig into a little, little bit of the data behind that. Um, and uh, I think the best approach is to focus on school inputs rather than outputs. So um, school outputs might be something like graduation rates or achievement or college going rates. Um, but the problem with focusing on outputs is that there are confounding factors due to peer and family and neighborhood effects that influence those uh, graduation rates and achievement results as much, if not more, than schools. So by just looking at something like achievement, we're kind of glossing over what schools are actually doing and trying to isolate their effect. Um, and today I'm just going to look at three different inputs, which uh, I've chosen because I think it, either they're important or other people that are loud think they're important. <laughs> Uh, and those are school funding, levels of rigor, and teacher quality. And notably, I'm going to leave off a lot of important things that schools put into the process. You know, access to uh, professional uh, healthcare uh, individuals in schools, or interscholastic athletics. Um, or th there, are, there are numerous things that schools do um, that wouldn't be measured by these. But we can only look at so much. I'm pointing it this way. It's probably not where I'm supposed to be pointing it. Um, so first, how are schools doing with funding? Um, it's essentially, are, are, are schools equitably fund? Do we, fair, do we fairly fund schools? Um, it's important to know that, on average, per pupil expenditures are a little bit less in poor schools, but not by much. It's, I mean, it's rounding error. It's almost the same, um, depending on how you cut rich and poor. Um, but it varies considerably. And so to get a sense of why it might vary considerably, we'll have a quick primer on how we fund schools in the country. Right now, the federal government provides about 10% of all school funds. That's up from about 5% a couple decades ago. So this, it's grown to 10%. The federal government is not a big funder of public education. Um, it, it's, it's in, it, it, education is a responsibility of the states, and they create the guidelines for funding. Uh, and basically, that, that leads you to 50 different funding schemes across states. Um, and on average, states, state governments, and then local school districts uh, roughly equally fund schools. Um, but if you look at individual states, that's not necessarily the case at all. So you might look at a state where 70% of their funding comes from the state government, and only 20% is coming from local districts, versus basically the flip-flop of that. So, why does that matter? It matters because the more state aid, typically, rule of thumb, is that more state aid means more equal. Because um, as, if, if we rely on local taxes, local taxes are primarily levied through property tax, and poor areas are worth less, and they get less property tax. So by heavily relying on property tax, you tend to get, get schools that are affluent, serving affluent people, getting a lot of funds because they're coming with a lot of property tax and just the opposite in poor areas. So states are able to kind of have a redistributive effect with school funding. So the long and the short of it is, it, it, you need to look at individual states to, to have a sense of whether or not funding is equitable. Uh, this, is, this comes out of work by Baker and Corcoran. This is the state of Illinois, and it offers a regressive example. Uh, so here on this, these five bars on the left, the lowest quintile of, of poverty, so that's actually this is actually the 
the most affluent quartile of schools uh, in Illinois, and you see that on average they get about $11,000 per pupil. And down here, this is the poorest, the poorest fifth of schools, and they're at a little over 9,000 per pupil. So that's why it's a regressive scheme. It's actually giving more money to those students that come from more money. Um, and, and the reason is simple. It's because you see this, this dark blue, uh, that is the local revenue. And, um, and you see that's a good chunk of the total funding here. And there's big disparities in between the affluent quintile and the poor quintile. And all these light blues uh, are various forms of state aid. And you see that it catches it up a little bit, but, but not enough to make it equal, let alone what people, most people would say is equitable, right? Because these are schools over here with, with higher needs, with more needs to be met. So there's about a dozen states or so that kind of look like that, the regressive examples. Uh, but there are plenty of progressive examples out there as well. There's the state of New Jersey. Uh, and here we see it varies from about 16, 17,000 in the richest schools to more than that, about 20, 21,000 in the poorest schools. And it's not because the local revenue, the, the property tax, is helping out those poorest schools. In fact, the dark blue is even more disparate, you see. It's because the state formula makes it such that those poor schools get their equitable share of funding. So in short, is funding equitable? There's not an easy answer for that. It really depends, uh, depends where you look. Um, so the next, the next input I'd, I would want to look at, because we hear about it a lot, is this idea of rigor in schools. And this I mostly included just because it's fun. Uh, this is just uh, a couple people that put together um, tallies of the number of times governors use the word rigor or rigorous in their state of the state speeches, which is just there to suggest that People like saying the word rigor, so maybe we should comment on it. And this actually stops in 2009. It goes back up, I would assume, in the past few years because of the Common Core that made rigor another hot topic for a while. Um, so what do we mean by rigor? I think people mean a lot of different things. They mean high expectations for all students. They might mean strong accountability uh, mechanisms for schools that underperform. They might mean challenging curriculum. Uh, and then uh, along with that comes college level coursework. So when I'm trying to think about how can we measure rigor as an input or what schools offer for rigor, I think that um, we should really focus on something that is related to access, right? I don't think that it's necessarily the most, uh, th th perhaps the wisest thing to expect the same expectations of all people, but I do think that it's important for um, high-flying students, wherever you are, to have the ability to take challenging coursework. So the advanced placement is, uh, you know, it's become this ubiquitous thing in the country where over two million kids a year take uh, an AP test. Uh, they can get college credit. Increasingly, that's not the case with it. But uh, regardless, it, it's, it's just what we'd call a proxy for, for rigor because uh, without having AP access, there are a lot of students that might not have that ability to take a class and have that on their transcript. And when you're applying to selective colleges, you might be at a real disadvantage. So this isn't a plug for AP. It's more a useful metric to look at. Um, and so myself and my colleague, Mary Beth Manningly, looked at um, AP access across all US school districts. Uh, and we cut it a bunch of different ways. This is kind of a simple takeaway from, from our work that just looks at the percentage of districts that offer any AP, again, by poverty quintile. And um, sure enough, the, the most affluent quintile does offer it at a, at a greater clip than the, rest of, than the rest of districts. But perhaps surprisingly is that it's quite flat. Um, and even when you go to that, that poorest district, um, there's not that tail off like the rest of, like many metrics might look at, that, that kind of scissor as you get to that end of, of the distribution. Um, so I think when we think about rigor as an input uh, and whether or not it, uh, a lack of rigor leads to more achievement gaps or trying to increase rigor would close gaps, um, I don't find that to be super compelling. I do think that there are issues of access and rigor that we should take seriously, but um, I don't think the data suggests that it's a super important lever to be pressing on right now. So what about teachers? 
Um, how do we, what do we know about teachers in schools? Well, unsurprisingly, they're considered to be one of, if not the most important school level factor at changing achievement. And a lot of people have voiced a similar feeling with regards to that. And it's not a surprise because you know, teachers are the ones spending all their time with the students. Um, and a good teacher can do really amazing things for a student, right? Um, and another thing that we're quite sure of is that when you compare poor schools to affluent schools, those poor schools, the teachers have lower qualifications on average by just about any metric that you can imagine, um, be it experience or full licensure or how competitive their undergraduate college was, whether or not they're teaching a subject area that they aren't prepared for. All of those things, poor schools tend to have more of that from their teachers. Um, so some work I did, I looked at, uh, along with my colleague, looked at rates of novice teachers. So novice, you're in your first couple years uh, in the classroom. And novice teachers are interesting for a couple of reasons to look at as an input measure for, for, um, for equity. In that, one, it, novice teachers, new teachers are generally less effective than teachers with a few years experience. And anyone who's taught for a few years, would, can, can, that, that probably rings true for. Um, it, you know, there's a steep learning curve. It's not to say that all novice teachers aren't good or that they aren't important or don't bring important things into the, into the school, um, but just that on average, they don't do quite as well as other teachers. And the other thing that's important is that a novice teacher typically represents a teacher that just left, right? You're new, you're typically taking the place of someone that was left. Therefore, it's, it's a, a way to kind of get an insight into school turnover. So if you have really high rates of novice teachers, uh, you probably have a turnover issue, which is the, a bellwether for all sorts of school quality issues. When teachers don't say to school, it means something. And then it also means there's probably not enough new teachers to be mentored and they're less effective anyway. So lots of trouble when you have way too many new teachers in your school. So how might that vary by, uh, by place and by, by poverty? So right here, this is looking at uh, the percentage chance that a district has a really high percentage of beginning teachers, top decile in the distribution. And um, it's, it's split off across urbanicity here with rural one end and large city at the other. And then it's a stacked bar graph. So it's looking at what the dark would be the average district and the lighter would be a poor diverse district in that urban locale. So if you're a large city and you are poor and diverse, you have about a one in four chance of being, um, being kind of overburdened with, with novice teachers, right? And probably have a turnover problem. Um, and then poor, diverse, rural, and remote towns aren't too far behind, nearly, nearly one in five. But if you're an average, just an average, not even a wealthy, just an average suburb or um, small city, you know, your percentage chances is cut in, in fourths, basically, right? So this is just yet one more metric to let us know that there are real and, and meaningful differences in teacher quality on average across high and low poverty schools. Um, so you know, recap these three things. Is funding equitable? Uh, probably not, but really depends on the state. Is rigor equitable? Um, well, AP trends suggest that there might be small gaps, but it doesn't really appear alarming. Uh, and then trends in teachers, there, do, there does seem to be a meaningful gap across, across lines of poverty. Um, so what can be done about this? And now kind of segue into, you know, these are numbers that policymakers have known for a while. Um, so how has that guided policy? And specifically, I'm talking K-12 education policy. Um, well, this is where kind of the federal government is, is typically looked at when, it's, when concerns of equity come into play. Um, so the reason being is that a centralized government is kind of where you can turn when lower levels of government, localities uh, and states, don't either have the capacity or the will to deal with something inequitable, right? So picture a really poor school district. Um, it, it's tough for them to deal with, you know, they might have 100% of kids on free reduced price lunch. Um, you know, who, who is going to make sure that, that, that those kids get what they need, you know, if the district is cash strapped, et cetera. So it kind of funnels up um, in, up to the federal level. And, the, and so the feds have really come into education, I think, as, as a uh, 
their, their, their primary value is trying to push equity and excellence as well. But I think equity is the one thing that they can, they can attempt to uh, ensure that lower levels of government can't. And there's certainly a history of, of, the, of the federal government doing things to push equity in schools across all three branches. So legal precedents may be set by Supreme Court decisions that can override state and local decisions. Um, so Brown v. Board of Education outlawing uh, segregation in schools is one instance of, of where the judicial branch stepped in. And then when schools didn't desegregate, uh, there was an executive order that the president physically sent in the troops to, to break them up in Little Rock, Arkansas. But most of all, the federal government now is passing legislation that tries to address, among other things, inequitable school inputs. Uh, and this is done under the, the General Welfare Clause because the 10th Amendment of our Constitution delegates the, the responsibility of education to states. So it's really un, under this General Welfare Clause that, that, that the, government, the federal government is able to get involved with it. And most famously, it was in 1965 with the passing of the um, Elementary and Secondary Schools Act, which was civil rights legislation. This was done because some students weren't getting what they deserve from public schools. Uh, and now the, 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 the keystone uh, legislation in education is the reauthorization of ESEA. So, and in the past 15 years, we've seen it grow, the federal role grow even more under this aegis of equity through No Child Left Behind, Race to the Top, and, and No Child Left Behind waivers. Uh, so No Child Left Behind was in 2001, was under President Bush, basically ushered in the accountability area, era, where we started looking at test scores, holding low-performing schools accountable. Um, then in 2009, uh, there was a race to the top competition, and this was right after, it was perfect timing if you were uh, in Fed policy because this was during the Great Recession. States really need money, and, uh, and the United States Department of Ed kind of dangled money in front of them, and they had to agree to a lot of changes in order to get that money. Uh, and then, just in the past half decade, No Child Left Behind kind of grew out of its pants uh, and states weren't meeting a lot of the, the requirements for it. So the Fed said, well, we'll let you not worry about these requirements if you agree to these other changes. So we see through these, through what is, what is typically a state enterprise education, uh, the federal role has expanded, again, under this idea of trying to promote equity and through kind of, um, you know, creative policy making, really. Um, and equity themes run throughout these, and if you look close and, and you have, maybe it's, it's a bias that I have because I used to be a teacher and I'm uh, influenced by teacher quality issues, uh, but we see a focus on the teacher throughout all of these bills. Um, famously under No Child Left Behind, a federal standard arose for highly qualified teachers. So that required that there had to be a highly qualified teacher in every classroom. And before that, it was up to the states to define how you were gonna be prepared, um, how we would judge you to be recertified, and, and all of those things. The federal government was not involved whatsoever until then, um, and that's because the Fed said there, there isn't a highly qualified teacher in every classroom. There's, there's some in, in, in some classrooms. Uh, and teacher evaluation systems were created, largely through race at the top and, and, uh, and No Child Left Behind waivers. Um, so for instance, race to the top, in order to, as a state, in order to just apply, you had to not have a, a law in the books that banned the use of student test scores in teacher evaluation. So through a lot of kind of creative things like that, the feds were able to uh, establish teacher evaluation in almost every state in the country in a very short period of time. Um, and even more recently, uh, states were all mandated to create what was called an equal access plan to excellent educators, where states had to look at their own data uh, and try to create some sort of path forward to make sure that poor schools got teachers that were as good as more affluent schools. Through sometimes creative means, changing pay structures, creating te teacher ladder programs, um, uh, teaming up with uh, teacher prep to try to have more placement in high need schools, et cetera. Um, so all of these things happened under, under the, the past decade and a half, um, which is really putting the, a laser beam focus on teachers as this, as this magic bullet solution, I think, to, to inequities in education. Um, 
And if you're an ed policy person, it's an exciting time because uh, NCLB, which was with us for 15 years, just got reauthorized as the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, and if you, if you were to say one thing about this new, if someone says, what's that thing all about? I would, and you had to summarize it in a sentence, I would say it gives power back to the states. That's probably the most often thing said about this new law, is that the feds grew out of their shoes and now there's so much public pushback. You know, education is a local endeavor that, you, it, that the voices were heard and they ran back their controls. Um, so for instance, the feds are kind of out of the teacher evaluation game. They got the ball rolling, but now under this new law, they're gonna leave it up to, up to the states to continue. Uh, states submit their own account accountability plans. They create their own ways that they are gonna deal with closing gap access. So, uh, you know, achievement, how are you gonna solve the achievement gap? The solution in Massachusetts might look very different than the solution in Tennessee. Um, Granted, the federal government, the, the Department of Ed still has to um, review and accept these plans, but without a doubt, th there's, there's much less prescription in how, how this is going to be done. Uh, and th there are another, a, a number of other equity type of uh, programs that, that seem to be getting pushed under ESSA. I'll, I'll skip over talking about those, but there are, it seems to be a wider net right now. Um, so. The question being, is there going to be a continued focus on the teacher in the near future of equity uh, policy around education? Uh, and I think the answer is it's unclear. Um, so granted, there isn't this push. It's, teacher reform is largely unpopular, right? Uh, there's a lot of pushback to it. Um, but and, and it kind of needed to be done under this, the shield of the, of, of the, of the uh, US Education Department pushing it. Um, but now the ball's already rolling and now states have already been thinking about ways to approach uh, the staffing of their schools differently. So it's unclear whether or not we'll see this, this focus on teachers uh, or whether we'll see it recede. So to wrap up, try to tie, this was a real, this was a mile long and an inch deep what I, what I just went through in the past 40 minutes. So I'll try to tie together some, some loose ends here. And these are closing thoughts, and these are, these are my opinions, um, which until now I've just been trying to uh, shield my opinions under facts the whole time. Um, so the first thing is that I think states should, individual states should revisit their funding formulas, right? Um, that there are a number of states out there and that if, if um, people in, if their constituents are in the know about that, that this should be pushed in states that have regressive funding schemes. I think that teachers are important. I think that um, there are a lot of interesting staffing policies that are being pursued and that's something that um, policymakers should tinker with and researchers should study. However, um, I also think that we should reframe some issues that are typically expressed as education issues as poverty issues or at least kind of duly frame them in that way. So um, to, consider the to, to consider the achievement gap an education issue, I think, is, is very short-sighted. Um, schools play a role, but, but the education gap, it, the, the achievement gap is going to exist, um, you know, regardless of, of school quality to some degree, right? Um, and, and related to that, <clears throat> I think it's important uh, for, for education folks to <clears throat> reframe economic programs uh, as being education programs. So something like the earned income tax credit, which is, um, which is a tax credit that goes to working families. Uh, they could be poor or near poor. And if you have kids, it can be quite substantial, up to six, $7,000 for a family making $19,000 a year. Um, and there's been a couple studies to look at how this might impact educational outcomes. Uh, and, and there's been two or three studies that actually have a pretty convergent estimate on the effect size where uh, about $1,000 of earned income tax credit to a family raises student achievement by about 0.07 standard deviations, which is about a tenth of the black-white achievement gap, which is meaningful and which is really efficient, right? That isn't a lot of money. So all this is to say that if in funding education schemes, it comes at the erosion of the social safety net, or if it comes at the erosion of of middle class jobs that families in that district have, then supporting certain education programs might not be an efficient way to promote equity. And then in general, I you know, leave you with, with this notion that 
you know, when presented with a simple solution or a more complex, nuanced solution, to you know, usually, you know, err towards the latter um, and, and avoid that magic bullet thinking that it's all teachers or that it's all rigor or that it's all funding, um, and embrace this idea of necessary but not sufficient thinking. Right? We know that teachers are important. Um, we know that schools need to be well funded. We also know that um, you know, coming from a fractured family is going to make any educational endeavor really difficult. Um, not having access to health care, not having access to green space, right? not having access to health professionals in your school. Right? All of these things are necessary but not sufficient to making sure that, that those students that need the help the most can actually climb the ladder. So um, they're my references. I'm, I'm happy to send them along if, if any of this research sounded interesting to you. Um, and then you can also uh, email me any specific questions you had. And if, if there were a question or two, I'd be happy to take it. And if not, that's it. Talk a little bit about the AP policy. You looked at just the number of districts that had AP courses, but did you look at how many AP courses mm -hmm. are Right. Because right? you can have one <coughs> for AP course and not have a whole selection, which still has an impact. On sure, sure. Yeah, so, so any, you're right. Any time that you try to kind of boil things down to a simplistic finding, you leave things out. Uh, and the data I was using was from the Civil Rights Data Collection. And they, don't, they have the percentage of students enrolled. Um, they don't have the number of courses on offer. Uh, so we also looked at enrollment rates. We looked at success rates. Um, and these trends seem to hold up across that. But, but you're right. There's, there's more to AP than a single course. And there's more to just challenging coursework than AP. So you know, it's, it's certainly a simplification. Yeah, I think, I think making conclusions that flow from data is, is the challenging part for people, right? And so that's why I didn't want to focus on outcome data, like you said. I wanted to focus on, on more input data, right? Because we know that there's so many things outside the control of schools um, that, that if, we, if we rely on uh, to judge quality, we're, we're, letting, we're missing the mark. And, and what you said, I mean, it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy when you choose the wrong um, you, you choose the wrong metric um, and, and, and lead people to making decisions. So I'm not sure if there's a question buried in there out, out, <laughs> out, outside of the fact that, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I, well, OK, so my question is, well, what do you do about that? Right? Because ultimately, I'm not the one who gets to make this decision. Right? So what are the rules that should <coughs> govern data usage? How, so it is using inputs rather than outputs one of the rules that you would generate for policymakers who become suddenly convinced that data is a wonderful thing, or who are already convinced that data is a wonderful thing. Because data itself is neither good nor bad. Mm -hmm. It can be both. And so how do we get data to be good rather than bad? Or is that just impossible? Well, I think, so under the premise that there's um, a policymaker who is data savvy and cares about equity issues. So OK, let's take that situation. Um, then I think what you would do is try to focus on areas where schools are doing well. I think you try to, um, uh, you try to create incentives to um, support those uh, lower performing schools or those poorer schools um, outside of data concerns, right? So um, I mean, this is taking the question a little bit afield. Um, but you know, if I'm, this is happening in Hartford right now, I'm concerned about Segre segregation in schools along economic lines. Um, you know, so what they did is they took, uh, they created a magnet incentive where they, they created magnets in the inner city where um, a lot of the, the lower income students lived. Um, but then they kind of went out to the burbs and tried to, they were really nice schools as well, and tried to sell these schools as being really great, right? You can go here and get an arts education. You can go here and get a pre-engineering education. Right, so I mean that's the same. It's it's just a framing from people that are that are at the district level, right? So if if you choose as a state and a district to just uh, post their uh, simple report cards that show achievement results, then you can expect to have white flight, like you know, like we first saw when Brown v. Board came down. Now, if you try to do something about it, creative, um, and try to bring you know mixed schools together in, the, in a way that Harvard is trying to do. 
you know, then, then it de-emphasizes the, the, the test scores, which, which don't look so great, right? So I hope you weren't uh, uh, requiring a, a real satiating answer from that one, Jack. But <laughs> Inequitable funding, yeah. Right. I don't know much about the details of the federal law, but how is the federal law going to make sure that things stay equitable? Well, it won't. I mean, it wasn't doing it before, even with a greater federal presence, right? I mean, the, the, there's basically what the, the federal role is to top up funding through Title I funding to poor schools. Um, but that, you know, the Illinois example, that the feds don't have much at all to say about that. And they definitely don't now. Yeah, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's right. And you know, Chicago and Chicago has really low mobility estimates as well. Why can't the federal government say that's bad? Stop doing that, Illinois. Well, because because that's not how government works, okay. <laughs> right? Because it's 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 within the state purview. So what what the, the what the federal government can do is offer inducements and additional funds, um, and that's that's their role. I mean, this is what you know this country was founded on a bunch of people that were really worried about a strong central government. So this is what we have. Yeah. We picked a good day to take you away from New Hampshire. Yeah, definitely. Earlier <laughs> in the week would have been better. But when you were talking about silver bullets, uh, since I've tried to avoid every possible ad I could see, what are you hearing? What are the silver bullets that are out there? What, how, are you, how does your data help you think about what you're hearing from uh, candidates? Uh, or are you not out. hearing much this I mean, I think debates are mostly like a silver bullet fest, really. But um, I mean, you don't hear much about education in any of these debates. Um, Bernie will say he wants uh, free higher ed, and Hillary will say that means we're sending Trump's kids to school for free, and that's all you hear. So I mean, you don't. I, I don't think that there's there's enough nuance in what in what we hear um, to to let us to let us know much. I do think that you know. You know, a Hillary president, I think, will will follow in a very similar vein to um, where Obama has been been moving the government in the past in, in terms of ed policy. Um, and I'm not, I mean, the Republican field, I, I'm not sure what it would look like. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, this is so basically there, there's a trade off here between equity and choice, right? Um, as as framed like that, right? And so it's no surprise, highly unpopular. To busing was highly unpopular. You know, forced segregation was highly unpopular. So, um, you know, so what are what are some of the alternatives? Well, the alternatives is is to perhaps try to at least the example that I use with the magnets is try to run the other way, where you're not saying you need to go to this school, you're saying, hey, kid from an affluent family, look how great this school is, and so you kind of you you kind of bypass that trade-off of choice versus equity sometimes. So that that seems to be a, a promising. Sure. Yeah, and there's solutions to that, though, right? So you can say that 75% of the slots need to be filled by those from the community. The other 25% can be selected through merit-based or something like that, right? So yeah, if you're not careful about it, you'll just it'll self-segregate in the other way. Well, thank you. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs>